Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight in our series of webinars um, organized by the Emirates Clinical Nutrition Society. Our webinar tonight, Pediatric Malnutrition, is uh, sponsored by Abbott and it is hosted by the Emirates Clinical Nutrition Society. My name is Ali Shawab, Clinical Nutrition and the Scientific Committee Chairs person, and I will be taking you through our tonight's webinar. A little bit about the society. It is a nonprofit um, organization or establishment uh, that has been uh, associated or uh, in 2016 by the efforts of a group of clinical nutrition. And and it serves to conduct continuing professional development activities, which enables nutritionists to update their knowledge and provide a common platform to network, aims to reform a lifestyle of the communities in the United Arab Emirates in order to increase their productivity and encourage communities to actively promote healthy living styles. Um, benefits from being a member of the society is information on medical meetings, conferences held whether locally or abroad, with details of continuing medical education programs, quarterly Emirates Medical Journal, which features research papers, case studies written by the local or foreign doctors, reduced rates and participations in all EMA activities, workshops, seminars, and conferences. How to be a member? Uh, either logging on to the website of the EMA, where the registration portal is available, direct email through membership at ema.ae, or directly through the phone number that you see on the screen, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are also to be found. And um, a few housekeeping points that we have for this webinar. It is live streams on YouTube, on the MCI YouTube channel. And if you have any questions or, uh, related to the uh, webinar itself, you can type it in the Q&A box, mention the speaker's name in the uh, panel below. Any problems with the session itself, you can live chat support is available and you can WhatsApp them through the number you see on the screen. And this webinar has 1.5 CMEs and accredited by Mohab. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker for tonight, Ms. Mariam Hamad Ashamsi, who is a senior clinical dietitian at ICLDC Abu Dhabi. She is licensed by the Emirates Center for Disease Prevention, CDC, as an international coach, professional coach, and diabetes prevention program lifestyle coach. Thank you very much, Dr. Mariam, for joining us tonight. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Aria, for the introduction. Uh, so I will start to share my screen and start to share the lecture. I uh, hope everyone can see it as full screen. Uh, just give us a moment. It's still sharing. Still on sharing? Yes. I will stop sharing and reshare again. Maybe it will work again. Is it now? Not yet. It's still a black screen. Can you do it one more time? Yeah, sure. I will do that like this. Is it showing now? Let's give it just a few minutes. OK. No, nothing is there yet. Sorry about this, but I'm trying to share it, but I will close the sharing and Hopefully it will share now. For me, it shows it's sharing, so I'm not sure. You can see it or no? Not nothing. I am sharing my whole desktop at this point. My whole desktop is showing at least. <laughs> Because at this point it's sharing, I don't know what's wrong. So, how about we move on to Dr. Thermad until um, the IT solves this with you? Maybe you can, let's try if you can share it. Uh, Dr. Thermad. So, it's better if we start with Dr. Thermad? 
and then yeah. um, we can come back to you whenever it's resolved. Okay, so um, I think it's uh, safe enough to say that we will be moving on with our second speaker for tonight, Dr. Sarmat Farooq Al Hamdani, who is a consultant pediatrician at Dubai Hospital DHA, pediatric residency co director, and the assistant professor, uh, DMC and SFU. And Dr. Sarmat, thank you very much for bearing with us. You can start your presentation, it's all yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Ali, and thank you for all for uh, attending, and good evening to all. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, just uh, uh, one correction. Basically, I, last week I was in Dubai Hospital, and from uh, this week I'm in Al Jalila. I'm consultant now in Al Jalila Hospital, as everyone knows. I think uh, now all the pediatric service in the government of Dubai will be in Jalila Hospital. So this is an uh, update uh, from, uh, from the DHA. Uh, so uh, everyone is hearing me, I, I believe, or is it uh, yes. my voice? Is it clear? Yes, your presentation okay. is on spot. Okay, okay. So let me just move the slide. The slide is frozen. Okay, okay. Now, so uh, my objective for today, uh, I'm going to sleep uh, to to speak about uh, breastfeeding as a nutrition. Uh, it's very important to highlight the breastfeeding. And I will talk about uh, breastfeeding versus formula and how to how they are different and uh, which one is better and what, what's pros and cons. Uh, definitely, I will speak about the growth uh, as far as uh, the webinar is about malnutrition. And uh, I will also touch base about uh, malnutrition, some vitamin deficiency. And then I will go to the other extreme, which is the obesity. And my favorite uh, topic always in all my presentation is cow's milk protein energy as far as we are talking about uh, feeding and milk and type of milk and formulas. So uh, we'll start with uh, one question just to uh, brainstorm. So uh, all of the following are uh, beneficial of breastfeeding except uh, which is, uh, which is, uh, I mean, uh, which is not correct. Uh, one, uh, one uh, or A, enhance cognitive development, reduce risk of malignancies in both uh, mother and child increase fertility in mother, reduce the risk of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, uh, and reduce the risk of infant bacteremia. I think it is uh, clearly uh, said here, and we will uh, also highlight those points. I think at the end of the lecture, should everyone uh, should answer this question easily. So uh, I will uh, talk about infant nutrition, and uh, starting with breastfeeding, the prevalence of breastfeeding has increased, which is that uh, good news, but the thing that 25%, they are stopping their breastfeeding by one month of age. So that is not a good news. And as you know, every uh, recommendation is at least for six months of exclusive breastfeeding. So one month will be not enough, but not better than nothing. Uh, mother at uh, most uh, risk of stopping, those are those mothers who are unmarried, less educated, and low socioeconomic status. And breastfeeding uh, has advantages for both mother and child. For sure, uh, the mother it improves weight loss, so that is the aim for each mom after uh, after they uh, birth their uh, child. Delay onset of menses, which is like a contraceptive, natural contraceptive, decrease the breast and ovarian cancer and heart disease, and it is cheaper for sure. And uh, for uh, for the advantages for the infant, decrease the sudden infant death syndrome, improve cognitive development, uh, decrease obesity later in life, decrease infectious disease like meningitis and serious bacterial infections, gastroenteritis for sure, otitis media, decrease the childhood malignancies like lymphoma and leukemia, type 1, type 2 diabetes, uh, all uh, reduced with the breastfeeding, decrease allergic disease, atopic dermatitis and asthma and cow milk protein allergy for sure, decrease inflammatory bowel disease. So there is a huge uh, uh, benefit of uh, breastfeeding. Uh, so I will uh, highlight, uh, I just brought some of the uh, Canadian guidelines for the Canadian uh, Pediatric Society. I, I will uh, highlight them here. One of them, one statement is recommend, uh, recommended exclusive breastfeeding for the six months of life. At least, I mean, provide immunological protection and breastfeeding is rarely contraindicated except for HIV infected uh, mother. Another statement, the first complementary food should be an iron rich. That's, I mean, the winning food 
and meat and meat alternative uh, and iron fortified food which is available in the market uh, that's when you start weaning of your child by four to uh, six months uh, growth monitoring is very important that's what the, our colleague and family physician they are doing they are monitoring the growth of the child with each vaccination cow milk based iron fortified formula is recommended for all infants with are not breastfeeding uh, soy based formula should only be used for infants with galactosemia and lactose intolerance or lactase deficiency and for cultural religious region those uh, reason they are using uh, in canada uh, discover uh, discourage use of uh, homemade formulas which is like in some rural area cow's milk uh, uh, for fresh cow's milk i mean and uh, soy milk which is some families they prefer it or rice milk which is now uh, available in the market uh, breastfeeding continue to be an important source of nutrition after solid uh, uh, and uh, have been uh, after uh, solid had been started and should be encouraged uh, to uh, two years and beyond. Uh, another statement, once uh, solids are introduced, the number of meals uh, should gradually increase. So you will just build up after that and then promote uh, uh, responsive feeding by monitor the child hunger and satiety, encourage finger feeding and drink from the cup. Uh, delay introduction of cow's milk till 12 months, that should be and always should be the case and uh, not more than 700 50 ml that is a very common practice we see it in our practice in the clinic you'll see a lot of patients will come to you with constipation and iron deficiency a lot of nutritional deficiencies and when you will check with the with the mother i think i'm sure that the dietitian also facing this problem you'll see that uh, they are taking an extra milk on the uh, on behalf of other foods so they will be having some uh, micro bleeding from the stomach because of the micro allergy and they will be iron deficient multiple nutritional deficiencies so you should always check with the uh, with the mom after one year how much they are giving, especially if it came with constipation and some nutritional deficiencies, which is very common in our practice, honestly. Uh, monitor consistency of food to avoid choking and avoid honey. That's all pediatricians should know in the first year not to give honey because of the risk of infant uh, botulism. Another statement from the Canadian guideline: encourage regular schedule of uh, meal and snacks. So three and three. Avoid added salt and sugar and uh, nut uh, nutritious, uh, higher fat food are an important source of energy for young child. So don't starve your child. Don't give a skimmed milk. Uh, as you know, with the six month, there will be more fat in the milk. And that's for formula. I mean, after one year, you, you should, if you will give a fresh milk, you should give it a full fat, not skimmed milk. So avoid skimming uh, the milk. Uh, limit uh, juice or sweetened uh, beverage because of the risk of the obesity, diarrhea, and uh, it is not, not a good nutrient source. And uh, parents should uh, be a role model for, uh, for healthy eating habits. Uh, here, I will speak about breastfeeding versus formula. So as you know, there is a cow milk based formula, which is the normal formula available in the, uh, in the market. Soy protein based formula, which is the, the formula that preferred by some families and it is, a foy, it is a soy protein instead of cow protein base. So instead of the cow milk in the formula, they will put the base, which is the, the protein as a soy milk and other additives. Uh, a hydrolyzed, partially hydrolyzed formula, they used to, to use it some, some patient and some, uh, some recommendation was there a couple of years back for the family of a child who's having allergic diseases to prevent allergy for the ongoing uh, uh, brothers and uh, sisters and I mean siblings to give partially hydrolyzed and now not anymore. So you will see the same formula and there is an HA which is hypoallergenic, which is partially hydrolyzed formula. It is, it was, seems to be, it was assumed to be uh, uh, prophylactic, but now not anymore. And there is some premature formulas and I will just compare them for you, just especially for pediatrician, they should know uh, about uh, those formula. So I will not go details about those graphs, but just to show you that, uh, that the human milk has the least amount of protein and the highest carbohydrate. So, so uh, more carbohydrate, less protein, you will see the cow milk formula, which is next to it, more protein and, uh, and less carbohydrate, and then if you will go to the fresh milk, cow milk, you will see the protein is huge and the carbohydrate is less. So here is the challenge for all the milk, uh, milk companies to reduce this protein, to get it 
approximate or equal to the uh, to the human milk, but they couldn't make it, and that's why it's still the the allergy. Because if they will make it, they will lose some of the essential amino acid. That's why they are really struggle to get the protein to a level of the human milk. That's why still allergy is always the case with all kind of uh, formula. Here is the calcium and phosphorus. It is less in the human milk and more in the cow milk and, and also more in the cow milk formula. And this challenge also will, will cause a burden on the kidney of the child. You know, the kidney is not yet mature, so there will be a lot of solute load to the kidney that can, can affect the kidney of a growing uh, infant and newborn. Sodium, potassium, chloride, all of that the same. You'll see the human milk is much less than the cow's milk formula, and you cannot definitely compare with the fresh cow's milk, which is really contraindicated for all infants till the age of one year. Here is some uh, brief about, uh, about the difference between the breast and the, uh, and the formula. You will see the protein is 1.1 in the breast and in the formula 1.5. So that is the, the struggle that our uh, all the, all the uh, milk company is trying to reduce to get it close to the, uh, to the uh, breast milk, but still they couldn't get to, to that level. So 1.5 and 1.1, it is not a, maybe you will see it, not a big difference, but this difference is really making uh, life hell sometime for the patient who, who is developing allergy and they are intolerant to the, uh, that protein load. Calcium, phosphorus, iron, definitely all are more, but uh, you will see the iron is less in the breast milk, but, they are, but it is more nutritionally available for the, for the absorption. And it is, it is a good source of iron, although in the formula, which is fortified with the iron, still it is 12, but the, the 0.5 of the breast milk is, is uh, uh, more reasonable than the 12, which is, uh, uh, which is fortified uh, with the, for the formula. Uh, here is uh, uh, also uh, both of them, they are giving 20 kilocalories per, per ounce, so the calorie is the same, and both of them free of bacterial contamination if you prepare them well. And, uh, and but the infant formula more mortality rate and uh, iron, uh, iron fortification, it is, as we said, 10 to 12 uh, milligram per liter of iron. So, so more of iron in the, uh, in the formula, but less, uh, less biologically available for absorption and to be beneficial for the child, less allergy for the, uh, for the best milk. Uh, there is secretory IgA, decreased colic, eczema, and, decre uh, and high carbohydrate, which is the lactose, lower protein, which is less allergenic, and the breast milk joined this more with the breast milk than with the formula. This is the only advantage, but not really an advantage, and contraindicated for HIV-infected mother. So that is the time when you will shift to the uh, formula. This uh, I saw there is a lot of trend in Canada about, uh, about uh, the cow's milk. I don't know. Uh, uh, family, they are asking a lot of about cow's milk and they will ask the pediatrician, what do you think about it? So, uh, I mean, goat milk, sorry, the goat milk is not an infant formula in USA and not in Canada also. They are deficient in folate and it is not routinely recommended, although some family, they prefer it. So that's why I thought that I would just highlight it for the pediatrician, especially and for the, our colleague, new uh, dietitian to know about it because I'm sure they are asked for. Uh, what was the drug to be avoided in lactation? It is a huge list of drugs, but uh, they are just not uh, obsolete contraindications. So LSDs, uh, mepiridine, uh, oral contraceptive, uh, phen phenobarbitone, sulfonamide, alcohol, uh, chloramphenicol, uh, semitidine, codeine, diazepam, ergot, INH, uh, 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 metronidazole, uh, radioactive material, uh, gallium, which is another radioactive, anti-metabolite uh, like methotrexate, iron, and tetracycline, all of those should be avoided or adjusted so your physician will adjust it for you. Uh, daily fluid requirement, uh, that's for, uh, for um, I think everyone knows about, uh, one to uh, 10 kg, 100 kilocalorie per day. After the, the second 20, it will be 50, so don't forget to add the 1,000 for the first uh, 10 kg, and then anything after 20, you'll add the 20, so it will be 1,500 plus 20 ml per kg for more than 20. And uh, sometimes you need to increase the fluid, so for patient on warmer, RDS, because of tachypnea, there will be more insensible water loss, and uh, those patients with some drug like diuretics and on phototherapy, febrile patient, you know, which each ML, which each uh, increased uh, temperature uh, more than 37, you increase by 10 ML per kg, and all those patients with the glucose urea, because you know the glucose will take uh, water with it. 
caloric need for the internal feed, I just uh, put this slide because it's very common that the, the mother will come to me or to the pediatrician that my child is not feeding because they, they are they used to the uh, to their infant when he's feeding every two hours and all of a sudden when he's four months old, he, he dropped his feed. And then when he starts with the weaning food, he will drop more and more. So you will see, simply you will, you will explain to them that the, his growth is less, so his calorie is less, so his need is less. So that is why you need to explain to them that infant less than four months, he need 100 kilocalorie per kilogram per day. Infant more than four months, 105. One to, one to three years will be 100. Four to six years will be 85 to 90. And seven to 10. So you will see that dropping with the age, that's why the need for food is less. So that's why you need to explain to the mother that this reduction feeding normal simply because the growth is less. So the growth in the first first month of life, they will add 30 gram, 20 to 30 gram per per day, and then after that, will keep on reducing till he will be like uh, like an adult. Premature infant formula, I, I just highlighted for the especially, I mean, for both pediatrician and and also for our colleague dietitian, uh, a premature preemies usually will give them the premature formula, those between those less than two kg. Uh, and then you will wait, or they are they are less than 36 uh, weeks of gestation till they will be 36, or they will be more than three kg. So till they will catch up growth, let us see. Differences from uh, regular formula: high protein, high MCT oil, less lactose, and more iron, vitamin E, and also that is the uh, the milk company always advertising for DHA and ARA, uh, ARA, which is important for the growth, for the brain development, and for the immunity and it will support the growth and development, as I said. Uh, premature infant formula, also uh, carbohydrates, reduce glucose, increase glucose polymers, protein, they are 60 whey and uh, casein 40% fat, which is MCT 40 to 50%. So there's some differences. That's why uh, we recommend always for the premature or IGR, less than two kg they, to, to give them the premature formula will give more calories, some differences in the, in the mineral load and some differences in the, in the glucose and fat and fat and MCT and DHA. So those things which will uh, help uh, catch up growth and also support nutrition, let us say. Uh, the, uh, nutritional, I mean, if they are not uh, taking breaths. Uh, nutritional support uh, for children increase, beta, uh, increase uh, those patients with increased basal metabolic rate, uh, decrease in the, uh, uh, in the macro and nutrient store, and increase energy need. Those all uh, pediatric, those all uh, infant need, energy need for growth and an increase in the growth uh, maintain, to maintain growth. This uh, uh, slide always, uh, I, I, I teach my, uh, my resident in the round, that is uh, routine growth for the uh, for all children, birth to 19 years old. We use WHO definitely. There, you, you, different, but there is a difference between WHO and CDC. WHO that is uh, more international. So the sample has been taken from the US, Canada, uh, all Europe, UK, Middle East, and Africa. So it is it is multinational. So. So the, the, the height, weight, the, there is a big difference between the two, but still with that, they, they try to make it mix as, as, as possible for healthy child, children. So WHO is more ideal than the CDC, which is more, um, it's only the sample taken from the USA. So that's, the, well, that's why uh, WHO is for all ages. If you want to, to use the CDC, it should be more than two years. Another point also that uh, for the best nutritional uh, uh, nutritional uh, assessment for the child, more than two years is a BMI, less than two years is a weight for high length. So that is, should be, every pediatrician should know it's about when you assess the growth, BMI for more than two years, and for ch children less than two years, use weight for length and height. That is for sure our dietitian uh, colleague, they, they teach us this. Uh, so uh, disease predisposing to malnutrition, uh, just to highlight the malnutrition. So who is at risk of malnutrition, let us say. Those patients who is short, having short bowel syndrome, I'm not sure I'm good with the time, short bowel uh, syndrome. So uh, those are premature, which they develop necrotizing intercolitis, they cut a part of their bowel, so they have short bowel syndrome, so the absorption will be less, so they are at risk for malnutrition. Inflammatory bowel disease for little bit older children because they are always catabolic, they are losing, they are not absorbing properly, and always they need extra calorie and they have a poor, poor, a poor uh, appetite. So that's why they are, they're, uh, they're, uh, they are at risk for malnutrition. GRD, 
those patients with reflux, I mean, uh, GI surgery, necrotizing enterocolitis, as mentioned, uh, chronic diarrhea because they are losing uh, in the stool, impaired absorption of a nutrient, they are definitely at risk of, of uh, malnutrition, altered gastrointestinal motility, so those patients who is having extra motility of the intestine, or a uh, patient who is delayed gastric emptying because of the bacterial overgrowth and a lot of things that disturb absorption and disturb nutritional uh, uh, requirement for the child. And increase energy need. And uh, for this patient who is like cardiac disease, they need more energy and also they have a problem with absorption. So there will be uh, no compensation for that. Uh, decrease energy intake, like patient who is MPO for a prolonged period of time for surgical reason or for any reason. Uh, dilated, uh, diluted formula, they sometimes either by, by mistake, and they will put one scoop, which is supposed to be for uh, for one ounce, they will put two ounces, so either a mistake or in, induced by the mother. So diluted formula will give half of the calorie, then they will be uh, reducing growth with the time and they will be malnourished. Uh, diluted formula, I mean, uh, uh, delayed uh, in the use of TPN. Some patients, they cannot feed and they keep on IV fluid I, as if the IV fluid is is, is named as, uh, wrongly named as a nutrition, uh, but it is not. So uh, those patients who are, who, are, who you expect that they need, uh, they need to be uh, nothing by mouth. They should be started on TPN as soon as possible and social factor when the mother neglect and, and this thing. Uh, marasmus is one of the of the cases that we used to see, and thanks God now, it, very rarely we are seeing this uh, disease. It is like uh, it looks like a, a little old man. So, uh, but the hair is normal. They are hungry. They are wasted. The muscle are wasted and grossly underweight and no fat. So uh, you will see them. The picture that you will never forget. Uh, and here we are seeing it for for patients who are having a problem with absorption, but not in nutritional. Uh, so what uh, what uh, uh, the picture, picture they have, uh, the cause usually chronic calorie manu uh, deprivation. So either due to disease, due to absorption, what we listed, or due to the not adequate poverty and thus not no, uh, not adequate uh, food and uh, 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 accessible. Uh, physical appearance, they are starvated, they are cachexic, they have a low uh, mid-arm uh, circumference and low BMI, and they are definitely stunted growth, as everyone knows. When there is a low calorie supplement supply uh, to the child, the first the weight will have to be affected, then they will be started the growth. And if the child is less than two years in a growing brain, they will affect the head circumference. So start with the weight, then hide the head circumference if the child is less than two years. And also, uh, but they have a normal uh, a normal protein store. So that is the difference between marasmus and kosher core, which will uh, which will go through in the next slide. Uh, what's the history for marasmic patient? Usually decreased caloric intake, as we said, but should be for a prolonged period of time. So over over uh, months uh, or years, and physical uh, examination, they are uh, they are emaciated, uh, they are severely ill, uh, little old man, as I said, uh, irritable, apathetic, hungry, underweight, growth retarded, uh, but the hair uh, hair are sparse. Uh, corneal opacity because of the vitamin A deficiency uh, and poor uh, skin turgor because of, there is no fat. So it's as if they are dehydrated uh, because there is no fat and that's why it's a poor skin turgor and uh, nail fragile and thin, loss of subcutaneous fat, muscle are wasted because of no protein, no energy. And uh, also there will be hypothermic in severe case, hypotensive and bradycardia. And also uh, there will be wasting or stunting of the uh, weight to height uh, or weight to uh, for age and uh, uh, less than 65% of the uh, mean average. Here's the other extreme, which is the uh, quasher curve. The quasher curve, they are, they are having mainly their problem, mainly with the protein, not with the energy as all, well, but the protein supply is less. That's why they will be uh, having some muscle wasting and also they will be odometers because of the low protein. So they have swollen, uh, swollen moon face, that's what usually we see. We see a lot of uh, pitting edema. They are stunted growth and sore and uh, peeling of, uh, of the skin, swollen hand and feet because of edema, uh, and then uh, color loss in the hair and skin. They will be having silvery color of the skin, of the skin and hair. They are miserable. They are thin, uh, thin upper arm, uh, wasted muscle because there is no protein, but, uh, uh, but uh, may have some fat. So the fat sometimes preserved, but the problem with the uh, with the protein and uh, with the muscle. So uh, what uh, what the uh, what they call it? They call it sugary baby because they they are replacing the uh, uh, the source of, of protein with the sugar. 
So high carbohydrate energy, uh, high carbohydrate and energy, but low protein intake. So uh, the cause is acute protein and caloric intake during uh, acute reduction in the protein and caloric intake during stress, such as trauma, surgery, infection. Uh, physically, they appear well nourished, but they are not. Uh, because of the odima, they feel that you see moonfishies, odimata, so as if they are normal and their weight is okay, but they are nutritionally deficient, mainly with protein. Prickable hair, normal uh, mid-arm circumference, and there is an odima, decreased albumin, pre-albumin, and because of the reducing the protein, they are at risk of infection. As you know, all, the, all our immunity is coming from protein, and there will be a delay in the wound healing. So they are decreased calorie intake over weeks or months, physical examination, they will be malnourished, they will be uh, less, uh, uh, I mean, uh, apathetic, irritable, anorexic, moon fishies, as we said, overall, overall uh, uh, fatness they look, and thin upper arm because of the wasting of the muscle, and there will be oedema, and there will be, uh, they are uh, 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 lifeless, uh, thin pale, uh, weak, dry, uh, dry hair, Fragile is applicable, hepatomegaly because of the steatosis of the uh, of the fat and the vital sign, they also hypothermia and hypotension. So I will talk about some important vitamin deficiency if I have time. So uh, vitamin A is one of the vitamins which is uh, mainly uh, for the retina and also aid for, uh, for the growth and healthy skin, uh, 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 mucous, mucous membrane, promote normal development of the teeth and the daily requirement is 1000 microgram. Where is uh, uh, where you find the vitamin A source? It is mainly from the animal source, such as egg, meat, and dairy products. So, uh, and some of the vegetable beta carotene. Definitely, everyone knows about it. it's a good source of uh, vitamin A. It's a, uh, a precursor of vitamin A and come from the green leafy vegetables also, and intensely uh, colored fruits and vegetables. So what is the deficiency cause? Bitter spot, night blindness, hyperkeratosis of the skin, xerophthalmia, and, uh, and, pheno, uh, and uh, phenodermia, and uh, keratomalacia, and it is one of the cause of preventable blindness in the child and even in the adult. Vitamin D, which everyone knows about, it is, it is aid in the absorption of calcium, and it's essential for development of healthy bone and teeth, and the daily requirement is five microgram. Uh, uh, the body, uh, uh, the body itself, uh, make vitamin D even if uh, if you are exposed to the sun. So it is natural source, uh, but still you need uh, some supplement from outside if you are not exposing to the uh, to the sunlight as required. This 10 minutes per day. Uh, cheese uh, is a good source. All dairy product, as you know, butter, mar mar margarine, uh, uh, fortified milk, uh, fresh and uh, fortified cereals, and food source uh, or is a good source of uh, vitamin D. Deficiency of vitamin D uh, or an inability to utilize the vitamin D lead to a condition called rickets, which is a weakened, soften, or a softening of the bone uh, uh, brought by loss of less calcium. So what is the pic picture of rickets or osteomalacia? So in the children, they cause osteomalacia and the adult will cause, I mean, in, in children will cause rickets and adult will cause osteomalacia. Dental caries, decreased calcium, increased phosphorus, that the lab what we, when we'll check when we suspect vitamin D deficiency and increase in the alkaline phosphatase because of the resorption of the bone. So the alkaline phosphatase will work to resorb the bone to, to, uh, to keep the serum calcium in, in a range, uh, and then an increase in the uh, urine uh, phosphorus, which is excretion of the phosphorus uh, in the urine. Uh, the picture showing the rectic rosary, which is uh, very clear, which in, in the costoro, costochondral uh, junction of the, uh, of the ribs. Uh, here is the picture of rickets, which also that's what not seeing that much uh, frequent now with, with our uh, continuous monitoring, follow up, well visit, and uh, and uh, checking, giving supplement, and uh, you, you know every child born with uh, at at birth they will give vitamin D as a supplement, 400 international unit. Uh, so uh, that's the bowing of the leg, curvature of the limbs, and uh, pot belly, which is that abdominal distension, and then Harrison Harrison groove or Harrison sulcus. Uh, uh, vitamin D deficiency also, uh, anterior post, uh, anterior, uh, this is the x-ray, well, how they look, they look osteopenic, osteomalacia, and widening of the epiphysis, uh, and we call it uh, uh, widening, and also there is some uh, cupping, fraying, if you will see in the x-ray, fraying like, like eating uh, epiphysis because of the uh, calcification, and from 2008, the recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics to give vitamin D 400 international unit from birth 
and especially in two extreme of age, the first year of life and then adolescent because of the rapid growth of their bones. So in those two extreme of age, and then another time when more than 60. So less than one year, adolescent, more than 60, they have to take the supplement of vitamin D and keep on checking. Otherwise, they will be uh, having these troubles. Uh, vitamin E, which is an antioxidant, uh, so it is good for the uh, for uh, for keeping the red blood cell and also will help uh, for uh, help vitamin K also promote function of healthy circulatory system and daily requirement 10 microgram where it is available it is it is found in in uh, corn nuts olive green leafy vegetables vegetable oil and uh, wheat uh, wheat germ uh, but uh, but food alone, uh, i mean but food alone cannot provide a, ben a beneficial amount of vitamin e and uh, supplement may sometimes uh, needed or it's helpful. What is the deficiency cause? Neurological changes, in the decreased deep the tendon reflexes, wide in a wide base, the gait, so neurological uh, uh, picture, ocular palsy, spino, uh, spino uh, cere uh, cerebellar degeneration, hemolytic anemia, ophthalmoplegia, and it is common in those cystic fibrosis, cholestasis. I have a patient, by the way, in my uh, hospital with the, with the failed KSI surgery, those patients, they have fatty soluble vitamin deficiency. So one of them is uh, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K also important for the clothing and it is available in the, uh, in, uh, in the cabbage, cauliflower, uh, uh, cauliflower, spanish, and, uh, and some green leafy vegetables and cereals. And what it's caused, it caused hemo hemorrhagic, very common question, hemorrhagic disease of the newborn for our pediatrician. They will present born at home and they present with uh, with the bleeding because they didn't receive the vitamin K at birth and they have prolonged PTT and coagulopathy and bleeding. Uh, B, B vitamins, I will not go through them because really we are short in time, I think. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about obesity, which is uh, the other extreme of malnutrition. I, I don't know Ali, if I have time. Uh, so uh, dramatic uh, increase in the uh, in unhealthy uh, unhealthy weight. Uh, uh, that is the def definition of obesity. Fifty nine percent of Canadian adults uh, are uh, are considered overweight or obese. Uh, it uh, it, ca it uh, current uh, trend continue to be uh, by if the current trend continue then by two, uh, 2040, 70 percent of Canadian adults, and that is definitely for other. But that's a study. Uh, in Canada, so uh, they said that if, if with this trend, if it is keep on going, then by 70% will be overweight and 40% will be obese uh, by 2040. So uh, that's a, a real concern because the huge money, like 4.3 billion dollar, is the cost for uh, for obesity in, in Canada. So uh, between uh, 1978 to 2004, the the the, the incidence of adolescent obese increased from 15% to 26, so almost uh, almost double. Uh, and I think we we noticed that in, in everywhere, especially here in our in our culture. Uh, definition of obesity by Canadian uh, Pediatric uh, Society. Uh, I think definitely you know about it. Uh, so there is a risk of overweight when between birth to two years, when the uh, when the weight, as we said, less than two years, weight for high, for length or height. So weight for length basically. If more than 85, they are at risk of obesity uh, between two years and uh, five years. If it is more than 85 again, but it's a BMI, not weight for height, for length. And if between five years and 19 years, BMI, uh, uh, usually use BMI, but this is not applicable. So nobody between five and 19 years say that this is at risk of overweight, only for till five years. Um, overweight, sorry. You have uh, five more minutes. Yeah, you can take okay. it. Okay, okay, fine. So I will not speak about uh, because I, I need to talk about uh, some uh, common protein allergy. So, so obesity as uh, so this is a graph I think everyone should knows about. I will uh, speak about uh, the management. It's multidisciplinary. Definitely, physician, dietitian, our colleague always helping in this uh, and supporting uh, the pediatrician in that. Uh, exercise, uh, social worker, psychologist, psych uh, 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 psychologist. And what needs to be done? So write prescription uh, for your patient uh, on physical activity. Uh, patient likes prescription, so write it on prescription. What activity? Remove the TV. Go go to the uh, go to the school uh, walking instead of, of the bus, and uh, give uh, some suggestion to the family to to do uh, a physical activity together with the family and adjust the food. So all of these guidelines, I will not go through them. I will just talk uh, talk, uh, talk in this five minutes about my favorite topic, which is cow milk protein allergy. 
what's called milk protein allergy is the most common and uh, two to 5% with formula and 0.5 for breastfeed. So please don't be confused that patient with breast milk, they still they, are, they can have a cow milk protein allergy. How they present, I will talk about, but two to 5% they are uh, breastfed, 0.5 they are from, uh, sorry, two to 5% formula fed, 0.5 they are breastfed. As I said, more protein, the more protein, more risk of uh, of uh, cow milk protein allergy. Soy also, they are one out of six. So soy protein is not for patient who's, soy, uh, soy formula is not for patient who's uh, having cow milk protein allergy. It, uh, the cow, uh, cow's milk can come from sheep, from goats, from uh, from uh, cows, but not uh, from camel. Uh, allergy to uh, to casein, whey, uh, whey, and uh, and gly glycine. So when you see uh, anyone, when you read the nutritional value of the uh, of uh, of uh, of the food. Uh, check for those three, and there is a list. Basically, not only those three, but those the, the main three. Any one of them uh, is there, so avoid that food. So not only cow milk, so not only cow and uh, milk and dairy products, but there is those three protein can can trigger allergy in your child if he is cow milk protein allergy. There is uh, two form Ig mediated, not Ig mediated. I, I would go through them. So what is Ig mediated? Usually, they uh, very easy to to diagnose. I remember. I was in Jalila uh, seven years back before I moved to the to the Way Hospital. So a patient came to, uh, came to me. Uh, uh, the, uh, she 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 the mother gave a formula. Uh, the patient diagnosed with cow milk protein allergy, and he was on amino acid formula. And then all of a sudden, the physician told her, "No, it doesn't look like he's having allergy. Just give him normal formula." She she went uh, from the clinic to the pharmacy. She she she. Uh, uh, bought a, a normal formula. She gave it in while going driving home, and then the patient came to me. Trust me, with with all the picture of anaphylaxis. So he's having all those listed here in the slide. Uh, so having asthma symptoms like uh, suffocation, like laryngeal edema, strider, all over rash, uh, urticaria, uh, angioedema, and and uh, all the picture of anaphylaxis. I I'm, I'm sure have you have been. Uh, you, you have seen uh, a patient with anaphylaxis from drug, from food, from whatever. So he came with all the picture of anaphylaxis. So that's IgE immediately. Usually it will, it's very quick within three hours and sometimes in, in a second or minutes. So be careful from that. Then IgE immediately, it is more of eczema, more of, of gastric upset, vomiting, constipation, bloody stool, uh, cranky baby, distension, uh, some, uh, some minor rash. So not like the one with IgE immediately. So I think IG mediated easy to diagnose, but you should keep it always in your mind. And uh, nausea, vomiting, colic, all, all, the, all the reflectic picture. And IG mediated, as I said, reflux, like vomiting, uh, crunky, uh, loose stool, some blood, uh, colitis, which causing blood, constipation, enterocolitis syndrome, like this. How to diagnose uh, the IG mediated? It is with uh, the, those small children, less than one year. And uh, and the non-IG mediated one uh, uh, sorry in less than one month those uh, are the, uh, the uh, non-IG mediated one uh, one to four months they uh, and the those present with failure to thrive IG mediated less for that with the non-IG mediated immediate as I said or within three hours those uh, non-IG mediated within seventy two hours and also uh, family history of autobi in both sides it's, uh, it's there. Ha, lab, no need for lab to confirm. That's always keep it in your mind. No need for the lab to confirm uh, cow milk protein allergy, but you can just support your diagnosis. You see blood stool, less albumin, high eosinophil and platelets. So that's just supportive. Ha, what is the goal of treatment? Remove all the protein, uh, all the cow protein while ensuring adequate nutrition. So don't remove it and, and keep him uh, uh, starvated or, or malnourished. Uh, and uh, good weight gain always, and uh, and uh, and uh, always monitor and uh, and always dietitian uh, is involved in this. So remove uh, the bovine mo uh, milk product from the diet. The dietitian will give you really good advice about that because it's not only formula easy to move him to the uh, fully uh, hydrolyzed formula or amino acid formula, but the, the trick when he will start uh, feeding after six months when he start weaning what to give. So dietitian, without them, we cannot do anything. Uh, allow seven days for washout of protein. So not it's not uh, magic. We stop the milk directly. So seven days for wash up. And usually we give 28 days. So four weeks to, to, to be clear the picture. If you improve, that is a cow milk protein energy. Uh, and then you will reintroduce the cow milk 
and monitor again symptom reg uh, regain then that is definitely diagnosis then you will start the process of of stopping all the uh, caramel protein and uh, and then uh, colitis can take three weeks as i said to resolve and introduce solid by six months but with the help of dietitian that's it thank you very much i'm sorry for uh, taking a long time because a lot of topic i thought that i will cover them and uh, uh, i think now victoria alia Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sarmad. That was a very interesting, extensive uh, and informative much. presentation. Appreciate uh, really you your much. time on that. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we will move on uh, back to Ms. Um, Maryam Shamsi. Uh, one second. Yes. Uh, so Ms. Maryam uh, Hamad Shamsi, Senior Clinical Dietitian at ICLDC. Licensed by the American Center for Disease Prevention um, as an international coach, professional coach, and diabetes prevention program lifestyle coach. Uh, so, Ms. Maryam, uh, you can start your presentation. I hope my presentation is shared at this point. So, hopefully. Okay, let's give it a try. You can share your screen. Yeah, I'm already sharing my screen. Okay, and you can put it on full screen mode? Yeah, sure. Is it on full screen now? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. You can start, <laughs> the floor is yours, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Alia, for the introduction. And sorry about the technical issue before. I know my laptop is a little bit old, so I'm sorry about that. So uh, today, uh, like, what Dr. Sarmad said, I'm not going to go what we, he get, was saying, but I'm going to talk about malnutrition in different way. I will talk about the double burden of undernutrition, overnutrition in children and adolescents. So uh, basically, the lecture will be talking about uh, the two major uh, contemporary uh, nutritional problem in children, which is undernutrition and overnutrition. Both are uh, epidemiological problem and clinical problem, but we noticed that recently we have this issue been going on for a while. We have micronutrient deficiency among children who is even obese or overweight. So this uh, subject will, will talk about uh, the, the double burden of malnutrition that will describe how we can measure the characteristic of this one. We will understand the causes and geographic distribution also. We will talk about nutrition deficiency, but I'm not going to go in depth on most of them. We also, we understand the pitfall of interpretation, the nutrition status in uh, children uh, and adolescents. Uh, so basically, I don't know if my lecture is, uh, is going. So the part one we will go to, we'll talk about the definition of double burden. Well, first of all, uh, the double burden of malnutrition among children and adolescents refers to the coexist of undernutrition and overnutrition in the same household or the same population. We most likely see uh, like a mother and a children, children who is obese, and we can see it all. The child is coming for the clinic with his mother or his father, and the father is normal weight, or the father is obese, and the children is super underweight or stunt even. Uh, also, uh, individual uh, will discuss the individual experience of also of obesity of mic and micro deficiency. So, uh, at the population level, the prevalence of both undernutrition and overnutrition in same community and region. Like I said, there's we will notice this, all of us as a clinical, as a healthcare, we will see family with different, like. Uh, over or under nutrition or, or obese or uh, underweight, which is make us uh, wonder what is the difference between them. They are living in the same household. They eating the same food. For example, they live in the same house or the same community. Why they have different uh, like body size or like you can say being under nutrition, over nutrition, especially the children. So, Dr. Sarmad already discussed what is undernutrition, but I will go briefly with that. It. it is a question of uh, deficiency intake of micro and micro. 
like the carbohydrate and protein and fat and also some vitamin and mineral. We can uh, decide if the person is underweight or overweight by using many, many growth charts with like example WHO growth chart, which is fine in WHO. We can use it and use the Z-score for it. And we decide if the children is being underweight or overweight according to their height, weight, length. For example, some uh, use BMI, so it's different. But currently we don't recommend to assess children who's under uh, two years old to use BMI because it's not really accurate. It's better to use weight and length, which actually better uh, reflect for uh, like the growth. Okay, so what type of malnutrition among children and adolescents is different. It's even being stunt, which is based on weight and height indicating, which is in uh, the WHO growth chart is between minus two a standard deviation and minus three standard deviation. I will show you where is it exactly in the growth chart for, uh, of course, a birth from birth to until age five, which is the cutoff point. And for age five to 19 is the height and weight is minus also two standard deviation and minus three standard deviation. This is can have many, many health consequences. The child can have in a development, which can uh, make them really poor in school performance, the, uh, reproductive in the female, female, there is so many issues can result from being stunt at a certain age. Okay, wasted is based on height also and uh, height uh, and weight indication, which is also between minus two and minus three, which can increase morbidity like because mortality and morbidity because of different issues. He will be fine. He will have different issue. Then it's being underweight basically, which is also the same. So like we can see it from there, they're both can be the same in everything. They are both an underweight, but there is different between each and every one of them according to the development and issues. For being micro deficiency, well, we cannot decide it unless we do a lab test, which actually can affect the children and health consequences many, many ways. Uh, overweight is based on the BMI, which is standard deviation above one or less than one, and a standard deviation above, I mean, above one for uh, a, like age 19 and above two for age five and less. And here you can see it's actually can the for be patient or a child who's overweight or obese, they can develop diabetes type two. They can develop many many chronic diseases. They can develop non fatty, uh, non alcoholic fatty liver, which can actually affect their health. Of course, we are mostly likely use this one, which is what I meant by minus one and minus three and above uh, one and three. This is the gross chart for a, a like a girl. Uh, who's age from zero to five. And of course, the, according to their age, to, uh, to their height, to their weight, and then we decide if they are actually in a growth of right growth or no. This is how we actually know. And you can find it in the WHO website. This is a website. You can also find the training course there. We'll teach you how you can actually uh, see how if your child or any one of your clinical children in healthy weight or not, and how you can interpret it, this uh, result to understand where the standards. For part two, we'll discuss about the geographical distribution of the double uh, burden of malnutrition among children. Of course, we understand that we have be, uh, children that overnourished or undernourished, and both can be two different. It's either because of healthier behavior, which is dietary intake and physical activity. Like we said before, there's many people that maybe overeat or undereat, people that are super active or non-active, which can affect being underweight or overweight. Biological factor, which actually can be diseases or genetic problem that can affect be, being underweight or overweight. So those different factors can lead to many, many different uh, and, and like food environment and social environment and living environment and health environment, which can affect all of this. Like food environment, food insecurity, not av available. Uh, sometimes that our children are picky eaters. So it's 
uh, it's really a need to know their eating habits so they don't go to being under uh, like overnourished or being obese with many, many deficiency. Social uh, ev- like environment, like f- breastfeeding, like the doctor d- discussed about the importance of breastfeeding, uh, work and practice, things like that. Other environmental, I'm not going to discuss more, which is, this is a framework of determining how the under being undernourished or overnourished in children and adolescents. And this is the distribution. I can, as you can see, being stunned and being uh, wasted over, uh, over obese for children is really distributed all over the world. It's not in, in, a, in one way. Like we will see children in the same country who is like stunned, who is overweight at the same country, who is being also stunned wasted and overweight you can see the numbers it's really there is no like no difference sometime so we need to really care about having this issue because we care about children who is overnourished with we don't care about children who's undernourished will have the stunt age or things like that uh, also the distribution among this country the, uh, this is a study been done uh, about this uh, cases and as you can see, there's uh, 57 countries from this. This is a global based studies that for students for 57 country who is low and medium income. And you can see that we have Arabic countries in this graph. Uh, from this graph, you can show the privileged adolescent and uh, being overweight and obese. Okay, so you can see the pool of being overweight and obese is being distributed, they're evenly distributed, most likely. Uh, the 16% of low income or low, low to medium income country, uh, like have uh, be uh, overweight and obese and over, uh, an even stunt and thin. 16%, which is nine of the, the 57 countries have the same issue. So nine of the either Arabic country or non-Arabic country, they have the same issue. So we need to really know why is it, why we have this diversity of being, of having the same country with two different uh, like characteristic of children. So the common nutrition also, here we will discuss about the common nutrition deficiency in children who is overweight mostly. I'm not gonna talk about underweight. We always care about underweight. We, all, we feed them, we try to control them. But we also will talk about being overweight and obese and having many deficiencies. This chart will show you everything that you need. Like if you have good nutrient and good energy, uh, or if you have extra energy and extra nutrient, that means you're overweight with nutrient excess. If you are having, energy, extra energy with no nutrient uh, vitamin, you are overweight with nutrition deficiency. And here we have the difference. If you are like low energy and low uh, mineral and vitamin, you are under nutrition with nutrient deficiency. So you can see there is a, the balance in everything. We need the balance in energy and even vitamin intake. It will fit your activity, your metabolism, your growth. So each children have different activity, different metabolism and different growth. So we need to take care. So uh, every time we see a children with moms, she will tell you to give a diet to a child, even though it's not really good because he's in a growth, in a growth period. But if you have deficiency, that means there is something wrong with this chart. That means there is something wrong. Either he have an excess of energy or excess of mineral. So it's really important to have a balanced diet of protein, carb, and fiber. And also it's really important to really talk about the, about the empty calorie we actually give to all children, okay? Uh, sometimes our children eat chocolate, they eat sweet, which is really, really not good in nutrient or don't have any nutrient, which actually can lead them being obese or overweight. 
Uh, so obesity fact, uh, and nutrition fact, it's what is it? It's uh, basically excess fat. It's uh, commonly because we are, uh, the children is eating high fat or high sugar and they, the, the nutrient or they having imbalanced diet. The difference there also in lifestyle, they get exposed to uh, sunlight sometime, they uh, do physical activity or not actually can affect uh, basically their characteristic or the being obesity. Uh, massive storage of adipose tissue also affects the fat soluble vitamin. Uh, can actually lead to mild and chronic infection. Uh, also can, can have consequences in genetic background or anything. Uh, there is also a nutritional deficiency errors and in, imbalance in of intake of a nutrient. Like we have fat, so, uh, fat soluble vitamin, we have water soluble vitamin. Water soluble vitamin, they're really replaced every day. We can replace them every day. We can have it every day, but the fat soluble is stored in our body and we are using it. Uh, example of the vitamin we will discuss today, which is really, really important is those vitamin, which is iron. We will talk about fat soluble vitamin with vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin E. And also we'll talk about water soluble vitamin, which is the volate and B12. I'm not gonna discuss, we're not gonna discuss the zinc B1 or B2 because those are limited to people that have bariatric surgery basically, and the deficiency mostly will go, uh, will not go, uh, we will not discuss it any further about this. So the nutrient we'll discuss is iron, which is really, really important to discuss, vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin E, and volate, which is by vitamin B9. So there is many, many evidence. There is so many studies that show the, the prevalence of iron deficiency in children, in obese children and healthy weight children. There is this study, we have it, and it has uh, been done uh, in 2016. Uh, more iron deficiency in children who is overweight than healthy children. Like you can see, the children who is overweight have more deficiency in iron than the children with normal weight. Of course, this is really, really important. We, uh, we of course, uh, there is so many uh, limitation in the study and many things. There is other study was done in Greece about health growth study. Uh, number of participants was 2,100 people that participate of children whose age from nine to 13. And it's, uh, it's compared between iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia, which we know that uh, the, 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 they're both different. So they found out that uh, that sh shows that children who is uh, children and adolescent have greater risk of being at uh, iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia than normal children, by the way. You can see it. The normal children have no deficiency. The number shows here the children who's uh, having deficiency, who's overweight, is from five to eight, while the normal one is from one by five to 2%. So the number is showing you that people who's obese have iron deficiency anemia. If they are obese and having iron deficiency anemia, that means their eating habit is really wrong. There is something wrong with the eating. They eat either eating not uh, low nutrient that recommended or high nutrient that can be stored and be dangerous. Also, there is another study done in US which shows that uh, children from age 2 to 16, 9.1% of overweight and obese versus 4.5 in normal weight. You can see the difference. It's from 9% who's iron deficiency anemia or iron deficiency versus 4.7 who's weight, uh, normal weight. And they're all the same age, okay? Okay. Uh, We'll talk about a bit full uh, interpretation of iron deficiency anemia. Okay, the basically in obesity, obesity is basically a chronic, it can cause a chronic inflammation because we have a histamine, a histamine uh, is a protein that to produce in the liver, which is regulate our iron, by the way, iron absorption in our uh, like, uh, uh, don't know, and other release. Uh, 
um, can actually affect, like you can see that there will be mild uh, inflammation in liver, uh, liver protein synthesis, which can actually, uh, actually affect iron production. The increase of the circulation of this protein, uh, protein the, the protein that produced can actually affect the iron absorption, which actually affect the ferritin synthesis, which actually can lead maybe to uh, obesity with iron deficiency. There are so many things we need to re really, really check when we want to know what is the cause of all of this. Is it because the the body is stopping the iron absorption or the body is producing too much iron or what is the causes? We really need to look at it from many, many com concepts on this, of these markers. Uh, also, we'll talk about the pitfall interpretation of many other diseases like uh, the importance of vitamin D deficiency. We, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sandeep already talked about it, about the bone health, about cardiovascular risk and also non-fatty liver, which actually can affect many obese children. Uh, if you go to the clinic, we always check, uh, do blood tests for all children. We will see children who is age 10 who have high cholesterol or vitamin def deficiency of lower than recommended, which actually in the UAE, we have a lot of vitamin D deficiency, which actually can lead to all of these diseases. So we really need to take care about vitamin D deficiency. We don't get exposed to the sun enough, actually, because our sun is basically is too hot for some people. They cannot tolerate or they're exposed to the sun in wrong time. Also, we'll talk about vitamin E, which is associated with also a trigger of non-fatty liver. Okay, vitamin A, which a doctor already discussed it, it's a wild source of animal and vegetable sources, which is there is so many studies that doesn't show that a lot of people with uh, obesity have any kind of deficiency in vitamin E. But in many meta-analyses show that children on adolescent have deficiency, especially for their overweight compared to even uh, obese compared to overweight group, like you can see, it's above 35% group, which compared between overweight and, uh, by the way, uh, it's the study done to check uh, the deficiency between overweight and obesity. And you can see from the study, 35% of overweight group are higher in deficiency than the, uh, uh, like, I mean, the obese is higher than overweight group. And which would make us wonder, why is it higher? Why, what is the difference? Obese people have more fat. Uh, vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. Why they have lower? Why they have more deficiency? Okay, causes of uh, also can be many causes. It's, uh, storage in adipose tissue can be impaired. Uh, vitamin release from adipose tissue also there many Gen 1 deficiency because the sun, we're not exposed to the sun, we wear too much clothes. Sometimes it can be affected by many diseases, like some people are allergic to, the, to be, get, be getting exposed to the sun, or sometimes insufficient intake of vitamin D. Uh, also, vitamin D is good for, your, for our bone health, which is really important to, uh, to really increase it. Uh, already discussed about uh, the cardiovascular, uh, we will talk about non-fatty liver, the common situation, but different, uh, difficult to diagnose. Non-fatty liver diseases is major cause from escalating of chronic disease of liver. From children, uh, prevalence of 12 to 70% of obese and uh, overweight and obese children will develop non-fatty liver if we don't really follow up with them. Large uh, difference due to the diagnose method. We really need to have many, many diagnose methods, lab, lab tests, uh, dietitian, and also it's really important to refer any patient to, to dietitian, either overweight and underweight. We need to check why they are overweight. Is it because the family, uh, the family itself is overfeeding or underfeeding? Are the children hyper? Are the children is uh, a diff like having different uh, like eating habits? 
a vitamin A, which is really important. It's a fat soluble vitamin, which is really important for our health and our eyes already doctor discussed it. And we can see vitamin A may coexist with obesity and children. It may coexist, but most of the time it's not. There is so many study done, it shows a coexistence of vitamin A deficiency in children. El folate, which is really uh, uh, the key to contribute in energy metabolism, which uh, can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and obesity. So it's common uh, to have it, which is most common in green vegetable and fortified foods. Okay, so it's really important to really increase this food intakes. So why we have this double burden? Is it the children being overweight or being hyperactive? Like we've been seeing children recently being super active and super hyper, and they re really not eating too much or eating too much. That's why they have a high fat liver. The eating habits also change so much, so much in the world. They've been depending on outside food, like fast food our children. And that's why it's really important to check the double burden of malnutritional children. It coexists, believe me, in the same household, check it with any family. If you have any clinic, you will see a, ch a child who's overweight and the mother who's normal weight. That's why we need both in consultation. We need to understand why the different in the same household, why the different in the population itself. The health uh, consequence, uh, the, uh, it's important to check also def deficiency in micronutrients, okay? And stunt and wasting overnutrition characteristic of being, uh, having high or excess fat and carb. Children who are under two years or uh, classified under or thin or overweight by BMI uh, threshold, I mean, more than two year old, uh, weight and length uh, assess for children who's above, under two years old, like above I me. Mean, uh, we need to check this, we need to assess children according to our growth chart that we use in UAE. We, uh, some uh, places use the Z-score, other places use the percentile. We need to check if the child is underweight, is the mother overweight or underweight? Is the father or the overweight or underweight? We need to understand what is the difference. Is that uh, the child is overeating or undereating? Is he taking all his nutrients or not? We will do it with our, the growth chart it will tell you if the child is in a stunt or the child is in waste, or the child is thin, or the child is overweight or obese. Of course, in any clinical uh, situation, we will never give a diet to our children. We will never give them uh, like a certain diet or certain food habit. We'll just tell them to what increase or what you should eat and what you should not eat. Now children are really increasing in obesity, obesity increasing worldwide, like the doctor uh, discussed about it, obesity increasing. But we also have uh, malnourished children who is obese and also have deficiency in many, many vitamins, which we really need to consider. Why is that? If he's obese, that means uh, he's overeating. Why are we having this? Even an adult, we're having the same situations. So we need to check what is the common deficiency? Why is it common? What is the food habit? And we need to really adjust our food habit to their needs. So it's really important to reduce the obesity in our country and understand what is the consequences of it. And also interpret the nutrition status to fat soluble vitamin iron according to what they need. So if the child is overweight or obese and he have iron deficiency anemia, we need to understand what he dislike and why. And we try to add uh, fortified iron uh, from cornflakes, Milk is now fortified with vitamin D, which we recommend. That's why we always recommend uh, dietitian follow up with any children, either underweight or overweight. So this is my references. I'm, I'm not sure if I took so long or not, but I am done from presentation. Uh, I think Alia. Thank you very much, Ms. Maryam, for that wonderful presentation. Um, thank you both for giving us very wonderful 
educational, interesting uh, topics uh, to talk about uh, tonight. And I'm sure we'll be having a few questions coming in. So far, we've got a few coming, as I can see. Okay, so if you're both ready, we could uh, start with our Q&A sessions. And for everyone watching, please uh, feel free to write your questions in the Q&A uh, box in the control panel down below. Okay, um, so the first question was a uh, kind of a comment to Dr. Sarmad when you mentioned the avoidance of honey. Um, so there is like a dilemma, it's uh, sunnah, but how are we supposed to avoid it? Uh, yeah, you can yeah. answer that. It's, it's really, yes, yeah, really challenging question. So whenever the science came with, with religion, uh, I need to stop here. So, but, but that's well known. I think every pediatrician agree with me. I am sure there is a couple, uh, like a huge number of pediatrician attending this lecture, but that's very well known that C. diff is there in the, in the, in the honey and can uh, cause uh, infant uh, botulism and the bloody diarrhea. And also, uh, I mean, some of them, they present with neurological symptoms. And so first year of life, uh, no honey. So I, 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 but I cannot say more than this, that, that other than the religion. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. That's, that's a fact, that's a fact. Yeah, but maybe after one year, it's really free, but only first year of life because the, the child at risk. Yeah, I'm sure uh, most of the uh, our grandparents would disagree with that. But yeah, <laughs> yeah they certainly will disagree with that. If we we'll go with the grandparent, then uh, we need a different session. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I agree okay. with you. Yes. Okay. Um, what about retinal binding protein status in children with marasmus? Yeah, uh, I think the dietitian knows about uh, about this more than us. Uh, uh, retinol binding protein. I know. Uh, I remember that uh, when you when the patient is uh, is marasmus and when you go uh, when you go with the nutritional rehabilitation, there will be some balance between the uh, retinol binding protein and uh, some prealbumin, something like that. So uh, that's why we give uh, we give vitamin A, and so there is some uh, some uh, calculation for that. But I'm sure that is more of the addition than than us. I'm sure you you have go through them. Would you like to comment on that, Ms. Mariam? No, I think the doctor already said that. But like I said, malnutrition is really a huge subject to discuss. As a nutritionist, we will not cover it within this session. Right. So yeah, it's really huge. But like this doctor said. Everyone needs to be seen by dietitian, children, adult. It's really important at this age, especially uh, since the pandemic came, obesity and being uh, really underweight or overweight has been affecting everyone. Okay. okay. Um, another question is, um, thank you for a comprehensive lecture. Would you please let us know what do you recommend for children under the six years old with fatty liver? Oh, okay. So uh, fatty liver, it, it means that uh, ma mainly it can, if it is not pathological, it came from obesity. That's why when we, we have an obese child, usually we check for with ultrasound. That's also that's our family physician or our pediatrician. We used to do ultrasound to check for the fatty liver. We check uh, lipid profile. We check for hemoglobin A1C. Uh, so that is a routine for any patient who is coming to us with uh, with uh, uh, with obesity to check for fatty liver. So what will happen? It means that uh, the uh, triglyceride and the fat will be accumulating in the liver, causing this fatty liver. How to manage it? Uh, he's asking, sorry, or she's asking about management, right? So, yes. Yeah. So uh, management, uh, definitely exercise. Balanced diet, reduce fat. So that is uh, that's uh, the only management. So more of vegetables, uh, more of exercise, reduce fat. If it is pathological, that's totally different. So patient with having uh, a familiar hyperlipidemia, and that's definitely this is this measures will work, but need uh, some med uh, some medication. Medication not really proof for pediatric. For adult, there is a lot of medication used, but not for, really for pediatric. So exercise and, uh, and diet. Okay. Um, do you have any data regarding camel milk formula used for children? I'm not hearing, sorry. 
Do you have any data regarding camel milk formula Sorry. used for children? Sorry, I, I didn't hear you in the question. Sorry. The camel milk formula used for children. Are there any data regarding this information? Yeah, so cow's, uh, cow's milk, as you guys know, uh, it is uh, high in protein. So if we are talking about cow's milk for, for patient who is uh, cow milk allergic, uh, uh, definitely not because it is more allergenic. So cow's milk, more protein. And, uh, I didn't put it in, in my comparison with the, other for, with the other formula and with the breast milk, but cow's milk, well, uh, I think you know better than me, it contains high, high protein. So it's not a recommended as a formula, first stop. That's it. So it is not recommended as a formula and it's more allergenic. So, and definitely not for cow, uh, cow milk protein allergy. True. Yeah. Um, does protein deficiency on marasmus lead to edema? Yeah. So the main pathology, so everyone knows it is an oncotic pressure. So when there is a deficiency in the oncotic pressure, there will be extravasation of fluids from the intravascular to the interstitial. So that is with any protein deficiency. So patient with the, uh, with the protein uh, energy malnutrition, patient with nephrotic syndrome, they are losing protein, patient with uh, protein losing enteropathy. Uh, so if it is uh, nutritional or pathological, when the protein is less, there will be decrease in the oncotic pressure. This decrease in the oncotic pressure cause oedema. So any protein deficiency cause oedema for sure. Can be just a generalized oedema, can, yeah, which will involve the pleura, the ascites, or can be only for the skin and the interstitial tissue. So the more uh, deficiency of protein, the more severe of the oedema. True. Okay, um, for Ms. Maryam, how can we control children eating pattern, especially when they do not understand diet? Uh, we need to control them by controlling ourselves, to be honest. Because the family, we until our children eat what we eat, basically. If we are overfeeding ourselves, our children will overfeed themselves. Uh, also, as an Arab, we have this habit that we don't throw our food. Okay, so if we put our, our food in a plate, we'll teach the children, you need to finish all the plate or else. Even though it's more than it's recommended for him or her. So it's really important for us to teach the family, the children, healthy eating, what is healthy. Now, there is so many, many, believe me, before uh, the pandemic, there's so many, so many children that have been going on and doing healthy eating lectures. Uh, they know what is healthy, what is not. The, we did also some campaign in ICDLDC where we went and took the children to being smart shopper and they from age, uh, from the first, uh, from grade one until grade six and they went for smart shopping course and they actually bought healthy food and they actually cook it and made the healthy food and they teach us how to do it. So children can be taught, but they need a dietitian with you. The family need to help the children and the family need to be healthy eating. And also we need to limit many, many things from our children. Like that we are giving them many drink that is high in sugar. We give them many food that is high in fat. Okay, we think it's really good because they will eat it. Like fast food food, they will just order anything for them. And they said, just eat anything. At this point, children will bring anything and they will eat anything. They really becoming a big eater. They will not eat from the house. They will eat only from outside, which is really, we need to teach them the consequences of those kind of food. Children understand that, but giving them restrict diet is not recommended because also I think one of them asked about restrict diet. It's not recommended. We can't teach them. The children can understand, but we need to go to their level. We will not discuss them as the scientific lecture. We will go to their level and uh, let them understand that this is healthy, this is not, and make them interactive with us. Like we'll give them like activity to like go with it. Like I will give them two paper and two, uh, uh, tell them to draw me a healthy and non-healthy food and they will do it. They will, this is slowly, slowly teaching them how to eat healthy. And that's, I hope this answers the question. <laughs> sure. 
Okay. Um, Akwashi Kor, uh, baby with CKD, not on dialysis. Do we have to restrict protein intake or do we go about with the normal protein intake? Yeah. So the concept in any uh, CKD patients, which is a chronic uh, kidney uh, disease, uh, to restrict protein when the initial stage. So initial stage when, because the more protein, more damage to the kidney. That's well known by, by us. So the more protein, the more burden on the kidney because the kidney will take care of this protein and filter it. So the initial stage that you should restrict the protein. So more restriction of protein, more preserve the kidney and the kidney anyways will end up with end stage. So CKD will end, will end up with uh, end stage renal disease and they will need dialysis. So the, the concept here, restrict protein, but in case of patient is he is or she is malnourished or protein malnourished, you need to give protein. But instead of giving an animal protein, you'll give plant protein. So that's how I, I, I'm sure that you agree with this. So you give a plant protein uh, instead of animal protein. This is the one. one. And I believe when the patient reached to a level of nutrition, to, uh, that, that's, that's severe, mean that this, CK, this CKD reached to uh, end stage. And once it reached to end stage, you start with dialysis. And the message here, once you start with dialysis, no restriction protein. So that's the point. So, so it means that here you reach to a level that you cannot restrict protein. And I am uh, here end up with CKD, which is end stage renal disease. So do dialysis and don't restrict protein once you start with dialysis because the dialysis would take care of this protein. Okay. Thank you for that, Doctor. We have a long question. Um, usually children who have an underweight condition have many nutrient deficiencies and it's uh, redited obese children as well. Do you think that the nutrition education should be for a child himself or for the whole family? I think uh, Dr. Fatma already answered that, that we have to um, educate the whole family as well. So I think we move on. Yeah, totally agree with uh, Ms. Mariam. Really, the family food reflected on the, on the, ch on the children. I, I have a, a, child, a, a girl, which is seven years old, uh, and because her mom always concerned about diet, she's always talking about diet, and she's seven years old, honestly, and she's always asking me, do I have a tummy? Do I, I'm, do I look overweight? So because of mom concern. So really, really, uh, it is reflected. It's a mirror of, uh, of her mom. So I, I believe, I totally agree with Ms. Mariam, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, hemochromatosis in children will lead to many complications like organ involvement, even in liver, also needed to be discussed. Uh, that's uh, a comment from Dr. Abdel Razak, not a question. Thank you, yeah. Dr. Oh, yeah, 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 right. So uh, the hemochromatosis, one of the uh, uh, cow protein allergy, I think he, he linked it to that. So that's why maybe, yeah, uh, and thank, thank you for the comment, really. Yeah, it's a good comment, yes. Um, are, or is goat milk not allowed for infants? It is not, an, there is a milk, so for infant, breast milk, cow milk, breast formula. Other than this, no, that's it. There is, there is some special formula, so definitely you know better than me. There is a breast milk, cow milk, protein-based formula. That is the standard, right? So if you don't have breast milk, you have the cow milk breast formula. There is some special formula. So aminoacid formula, partially hydrolyzed, completely hydrolyzed, uh, metabolic formulas for patients with, uh, with metabolic diseases. There is a huge number of formula, high, high protein uh, formula, infantrine or whatever. So those, those formulas are uh, special. So a special formula is not a cow milk. Is, I mean, a camel milk or, or uh, goat milk is not in, in this formula and not and this uh, uh, till now, till now, mm -hmm. till today, yeah. Okay. Uh, when mentioning temporary blindness and vitamin A deficiency, how often does that occur in premature newborn children compared to the normal newborn? Yeah, so premature newborn, usually when they, they're born, usually they have some, uh, some reserve. So, and that's why uh, when the child, when the baby start feeding, we used to do uh, th three things. So uh, usually when the premature start feeding, we'll, we'll go with the Guthrie test, which is the test that we do for, for genetic disease. We start with multivitamins uh, at the same time, and then we'll do uh, brain ultrasound. So those things that we, so that we'll never forget. So those things we will, we will, uh, we will give it. And I'm sure that uh, also uh, our neurologist uh, will agree on that. So, Vitamin supplement always, uh, always there, 
and uh, and the usually the vitamin vitamin A is a long standing uh, thing so the premature they have retinopathy of prematurity because of the exposure to oxygen they have uh, revascularization or extravascularization of the retina but that is not blindness or the affection of the vision due to vitamin A deficiency. So I, I, I didn't hear about vitamin A deficiency. Maybe one of our colleagues and the neonatologist can comment on that. Uh, a, a newborn, they have uh, a premature newborn, they have retinopathy, which is mainly due to oxygen toxicity on the baby and vascularization of the or new vascularization of the retina, but not due to vitamin A deficiency. I, I don't hear about vitamin A deficiency premature. Okay. Um, this is a question for Dr. Maryam, that a child nine-year-old obese, can we restrict the calorie intake or only to encourage the physical activity? If you can clarify on that. Well, we, can, we need to encourage them in physical activity because uh, since the epidemic, we, our children have been non-active. So activity level below. So it's important to encourage activity, but not restrict diet or restrict calorie. It's like limiting some kind of food, like limit high sugar food, limit high salt, uh, limit high fat food. That's all. We don't restrict diet. We don't give them like a diet like normal people and tell them to follow this because they're still in like in growing stage. They like, still they're going to grow. So they need to eat as much as uh, their body need and they need to eat according to their calorie needs. So we don't restrict diet according to that, but we most likely do try to maintain or at least follow the, uh, the child for a while, but restrict some food and try to give them food need according to their calorie need or growth need. So they will grow really healthy at a certain age because at a certain point they will try to go taller. The weight will change, the height will change, the hormone will change. So no strict diet, healthy eating, physical activity is really important. Limit TV time, like the doctor said, limit the TV time, limit uh, PC time. Uh, try to make them more active, like more than two hours on the laptop is not recommended. Even for us adults, it's not recommended. So it's better to more activity, being more active, like make them move, uh, phone is not always there with them or playing with the phone all the time. Okay, thank you for that. Um, what about obese children who are on steroid treatment and on very low caloric intake? How to approach their development? Yeah, so, uh, sorry, this is for me, right? Yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, steroid, one of the side effects of steroid is as, you know, the list of side effects of the steroid is a huge, like from cataract, from hypertension, from uh, from obesity, from uh, stria, whatever. So a lot of uh, a lot of side effects. One of them is the obesity. So really, you cannot avoid. So, but you want to replace it. I mean, compensate it. Compensate it by phys by physical activity. Other than this, uh, it is a, is a a non side effect. So you take uh, steroid. It will cause initially fluid retention. And then after that, is a real obesity. So I, I think you cannot avoid it, but you can at least minimize it. So for sure, you cannot avoid, especially on patient who is receiving high dose of steroid. So high dose steroid, that's for sure you cannot avoid obesity, but you will do some physical activity if allowed, because you cannot talk about patient who is on chemotherapy and he is uh, uh, and he's leukemic patient and he's taking uh, steroid. And then you will tell him, no, you have to do 60 minutes of physical activity daily to uh, to avoid the obesity. So, you know, always prioritize. Always as a physician, we prioritize. We we don't bother about obesity, but we bother about the leukemia. So we cannot uh, avoid avoid having a child obese. We don't give a steroid. So so always a balance. And steroid always given, not, not a cosmetic, usually given for diseases which really need it, like rheumatological disease, oncology, and autoimmune diseases. So you have to, to give it. But, but if, if uh, physical activity is allowed, then physical activity to reduce, to minimize, but not to avoid. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, uh, kids with cystic fibrosis are at risk of malnutrition. What are the main recommendations? So the main recommendation, they are having malabsorption. Basically, why malabsorption? Because their, uh, their uh, uh, bile secretion is affected. 
Uh, so they have malnutrition due to the malabsorption. So they don't have proper absorption. So how you uh, how you will uh, replace it? You will give simply you will give pancreatic enzyme replacement. So now with the advanced treatment, there is treatment for that. So there is no pancreatic secretion because of the thick mucus and obstruction to the common bile duct. And so you will give uh, a pancreatic enzyme replacement, adjust the dose. If the patient not absorbing well, you will you will increase more. And also you will give fatty soluble vitamins to replace and the, and the non solid fatty soluble vitamins. And usually we give it in a high dose. So we don't give the recommended daily requirement that I mentioned them. We give double, triple, or even more. And also we adjust it by increasing the uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement. So no pancreatic enzyme from natural pancreatic enzyme will give the pancreatic enzyme supplement. Okay. Plus the vitamin supplement, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, two questions in one, uh, or two in one questions. Is it preferable to give older children cow milk or goat milk or camel milk? Is there a difference between that? And does camel milk have a better intake in people with cow milk allergy or not? Okay, uh, let's see, first of all, you are talking about older children. So older children, what and what you understand from the question, older children, like more than one year, right? Yes. Yeah, so if we are talking about cow milk protein allergy, cow milk protein allergy is a disease of infant. So it is 90% resolved by one year of age. So I'm sure you, you, you know about this, uh, this as a dietitian. So it is a disease of the first couple of months of life, is even the first month of life and then with the time it will it will resolve usually by one year it, if it is mild i i prefer to do a challenge i i mean i give them the cow milk uh, protein by six months and if this if it is severe same like anaphylactic which is the ig mediated usually i postponed it to one year so by one year 90 percent they will outgrow it so if you are talking about cow milk protein energy by one year usually should be not so it should be there should be no cow milk protein energy and in the worst case scenario till two years so so it's a disease of infant toddler so in this age group so if you are if if the question about the older age group they can take any any milk it is not a formula so cow milk camel milk goat milk all but the goat milk the drawback of the goat milk uh, is the uh, folate deficiency so if you give a go fresh goat, goat milk you need to fortify it or supply supply uh, folic acid at least one milligram per day so this is the the problem but uh, but the concern about the camel milk which we, as we say that is high sodium uh, high protein load it's not a not a concern for us because the kidney is well matured by two years you know by two years the, mm -hmm. the kidney will be well matured so it will take care of this load and there will be no concern not like a developing kidney especially for healthy kidney and uh, and also there is no concern about allergy so by two years no concern by one year 90 percent no concern and uh, so but uh, everything can be given and as per preference Okay, thank you for that, doctor. Yeah. And for Dr. Mariam, do you have any suggestions like activities to encourage children how to eat healthy food? Well, and how to encourage, uh, sorry, and how to encourage families to restrict sweets and unhealthy choices other than education? Other than education, well, uh, first is about the activities. Well, so many activities you can do actually. Uh, you can start with giving them a drawing, uh, for example, tell them to draw healthy food and non-healthy food. This is between you and children and see who did it the best and give them a reward, which is a good reward, like healthy eating. Uh, second activity is exercise. Just go to the YouTube, open it, write physical activity for children. You will find many, many videos about how to do physical activity. Let the children follow it. This is another activity children can do. Even the family can do it with them and see who would do it the best and try to do it mostly was like most activity need the parents with them. Don't let the children do the activity alone. Be active with them. Let them move. If you do exercise, let them exercise with you. Most of us kick our children when you do exercise because we want to do it and concentrate on ourselves. But we actually recommend let them do exercise with you. Open YouTube for them, not for watching cartoon, but open YouTube for them to do physical activity. There's so many videos 
that last for 30 minutes of them doing really good activity, which is good for the muscles, good for the bone, uh, which I recommend for uh, this is another activity. Uh, also, you can buy from many stores food sample and tell them which healthy, which not, and teach them yourself as a mother or even as a dietitian, which is healthy or which is not, and also repeat it for them and the family. This is many, many, many way to really encourage activity. It depends on the family. And then if whoever asks if it's your mother or you are a dietitian, you know how to encourage activity. But if you are a mother, you need to do it. Like you need to tell them to draw it, uh, encourage them to eat healthy. You eat healthy, so they eat healthy. Uh, try to let them snack on healthy things. If you want them to limit sweet, let them snack on healthy food, like uh, give them skewered uh, fruits with drizzles of chocolate, it's healthy. At least they will eat their fruit. It have healthy chocolate, which is not bad, by the way, it's dark chocolate. And really, there is so many ways to eat healthy food and let the children enjoy it. Uh, so you can find many, many recipes for healthy eating. Uh, you can also discuss with dietitian what you can do. So, so many dietitian will help you with that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have a comment also for you from Dr. Abdurazak, uh, Dr. Samrat. Um, obesity due to steroid is a Cushing syndrome, occur most common when it's recommended in condition of nephrotic syndrome or child malignant disease. Where is where the chance of obesity occurrence? But for example, NS is uh, NS the high protein diet recommended special milk advice with restrictions of sodium can need special attendance of the dietitian. Yeah, as we said, there's some fluid uh, retention because of the steroids. So uh, absolutely agree. Yeah. So uh, more more of uh, sodium restriction and uh, diuretics also. But then at the end, uh, there should be some uh, adjustment of the food. But I think whatever you'll do, still the Cushing syndrome, uh, if you are giving the high dose of steroid, uh, I think not easy to avoid. Thank you for that. Uh, we still have so many questions coming in, but we have run out of the Q&A time. If you have any more questions, we can still email them to us and we will forward your questions to the, uh, our speakers to answer that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sarmad. Thank you very much, Ms. Maryam. Thank you both for bearing with us tonight. Thank you both for giving us wonderful information and insights uh, on our topic for tonight. Uh, any last comments you would like to add for our audience? Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Alia, Dr. Alia and Dr. Maryam for, your, uh, for inviting me first. And I um, really enjoyed uh, talking uh, about nutrition, especially in the with the presence of your background, uh, nutritional support and uh, dietitian support, I mean. So thank you very much and hope to see you again in the next uh, webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for inviting me. It was really interesting. I really enjoy everyone's lecture. It was, and I enjoy so much your, the Q&A. Thank you so much for inviting me for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, now we will be moving on to our next speaker um, from Abbott, uh, sponsoring company, um, Ms. Jinan. Okay. Yes, Ms. Jinan Asami, Associate Product Manager from Abbott Nutrition, United Arab Emirates. Um, hello, welcome. Ms. Jinan, thank you for bearing with us and uh, I'm sure you've been waiting for a while. Uh, we're very happy to have you with us. Uh, you may start. Sure, let me just share my screen. Please let me know if you can see it. Yes, you can just put it on full screen. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all here today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've been in uh, many of the Emirates Clinical Nutrition Society webinars. My name is Jinan Asami. I'm the Associate Product Manager for Abbott Medical Nutrition in the UAE. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the speakers, Dr. Sarmad and uh, Dr. Maryam for their great presentations. My presentation will only be adding on uh, to their uh, highly informative presentations 
and to discuss what products we have in our portfolio that might help meet the needs of the infant and pediatric patients that you are facing um, in your day-to-day -day practice in the hospitals. Now, for the sake of time today, I'm only going to be discussing the Pediasure portfolio. And if there are any questions about our infant product, which is Similac High Energy, I would love to take that offline uh, with um, either, you know, with, uh, with the attendees or through our medical representatives. So just to quickly go through um, malnutrition, as we discussed today, I'm not going to take time on this slide, but malnutrition is either undernutrition or overnutrition. And regardless whether it's under or overnutrition, there are always irreversible negative health outcomes. So it's very important to make sure that it's assessed early on and given the right type of nutrition intervention to prevent these outcomes. So such outcomes uh, can have negative effects on growth, on physical development, on cognitive development, as well as impairing the immunity, which can increase the chances for diseases, chronic infection, complications, especially for hospitalized patients, and increasing the post-operative uh, post hospital stays for these children. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with Pediasure. Um, we have it available in retail outlets in the powder form. But today I want to talk about our hospital portfolio, which is not available in retail, of course, because it needs to be uh, recommended or prescribed by a pediatrician, by a dietitian, depending on the need or the medical condition of the patient. Um, Pediasure has been around since 1988, uh, treating children with nutritional problems. It has a lot of scientific evidence to support it with more than 16 studies uh, conducted on over 1,500 children. And in terms of taste, we have numerous taste trials that show that it is the preferred taste by children. So this is our entire uh, tree that we have for Pediasure. As you can see, we have numerous different types of products depending on the needs of the patient. We have malnutrition products. We have on the upper left-hand side, Pediasure Plus, Plus, which is a higher caloric, higher protein formula. We have the standard Pediasure Growing Gain, which is a one calorie per ml formula. We have Pediasure Fiber, and we have our Pediasure Peptide, which is a GI intolerance formula. Now, the entire Pediasure range is suitable for children ages one to 10 or uh, between the weight of eight to 30 kilograms. They can all be used as both oral and tube feeding formulas. All of the bottles that you see in front of you are, uh, can be directly connected to a tube feeding set. So it's considered as a closed system. And all our products uh, in the Pediasure range are gluten-free and suitable for lactose intolerance. So as you can see here, uh, Pediasure is a complete and balanced source of nutrition. It can be given as a sole source of nutrition for the patient if the patient is on, uh, let's say, tube feeding and isn't consuming anything orally, or can be given as a supplemental source of nutrition. It contains seven grams of protein, which is about 14% of the entire caloric content, uh, one calorie per ml, so it's not considered a high energy uh, formula. We have it available in two flavors, chocolate and vanilla, and it contains 27 vitamins and minerals along with DHA and omega-3. Uh, moving on to Pediasure Fiber. Now, this is a product that I'm sure um, not many of you are familiar with as much as our standard Pediasure. It comes as a can, uh, in a can packaging. However, it can be used for both oral and tube feeding. It's, again, one calorie per ml contains seven grams of protein, and it contains three grams of fiber. The osmolality is about 400 milliosmoles per kilogram of water, so it is considered a near isotonic solution to help prevent any cases of osmotic diarrhea by the patients. Now, if we look at the uh, fiber content that's available, it contains a blend of soluble and insoluble fibers and short-chain fructooligosaccharide, which is a type of prebiotic that's designed to support the, uh, the digestive tract and the health uh, of uh, these children. So usually we 
do not have fiber in our standard pediatric formula. And that's because these children um, that are using it as a supplemental source of nutrition, we're expecting them to also consume a healthy balanced diet, which does contain fiber. However, for cases where children do need this extra boost of fiber, we do have this option available for them. It also contains 20% of the energy uh, from fat as MCT. And this, of course, as you know, is to support better absorption uh, by the children. And the renal solute load is around 299. So it's, it has a lower renal solute load. Moving on to Pediasure Plus. Now this is our higher calorie, uh, higher protein formula. It's made for uh, children who need um, a higher boost of energy and protein in a smaller amount of volume. So it's uh, again, 1.5 kilocalorie per ml in the entire bottle, it's 300 calories. It is a complete and balanced source of nutrition with about 8.4 grams of protein, which is around 11% of the total calorie uh, content and it contains 500 milliosmoles of kilogram of water, which is the osmolality. So slightly higher in terms of osmolality, of course, higher calories, higher protein. So this is expected. Now, in terms of the flavor that's available, we have three different types of flavors. We have vanilla, strawberry, and banana for Pediasure Plus. Again, it does contain MCT. So it's about 20% of MCT. This is for better absorption and tolerability. It's uh, suitable for um, patients who suffer from gluten intolerance or lactose intolerance, uh, similar to all our PediaSure products. And in terms of the taste, there was a taste test done in the UK where 70% of children preferred the taste of PediaSure Plus. They preferred the vanilla and the banana um, the most out of other uh, products available in the market. Now, when it comes to protein content, it's really important to make sure that whatever supplement you're giving the, the child, it's meeting the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations so that the child doesn't suffer from any protein um, or energy malnutrition. So for the age groups of one to three, they recommend having a supplement that's between five to 20% of the caloric content and from ages four to 18 to have between 10 to 30. So all, all our Pediasure products fall within these ranges. Pediasure Plus has 11. As we discussed earlier, uh, the standard Pediasure, the growing gain has 14. So we fall uh, between these ranges and that's what makes Pediasure a very suitable product for children ages one to 10. Now moving on to the last product in our portfolio. And I think this is the product that was most recently added, it's been a couple of years available here in the UAE. Um, and this product is designed specifically for children who suffer from any sort of GI or gastrointestinal conditions, uh, maldigestion, malabsorption. It helps improve the absorption, tolerability. And we'll talk about the specific components of this product and what makes it um, a unique product in the market available. It's uh, available in a vanilla flavor and it's a one calorie per ml uh, formula. So it has 200 calories in the entire bottle. Now, what makes this product unique for children who suffer from GI intolerance is the fact that it has hydrolyzed protein. But the hydrolyzed protein that we have available in this formula, it comes in the form of 70% partially hydrolyzed whey protein and 30% partially hydrolyzed casein protein. We're the only formula available in the market that has a blend or a mix of partially hydrolyzed whey and partially, hyd partially hydrolyzed casein. And the reason why we've included casein in our formula is because it really enhances the taste of the overall product. I'm not sure if you guys have tried uh, peptide-based formulas in general, whether it's for pediatric children or for adults, but it has a very bitter taste. And when the protein is broken down, of course, this bitter taste can make it difficult to uh, accept the product, especially when it's younger children. So by adding this casein to the product, we notice that it greatly improves the taste of the product. So the caloric content is about 12% of the total calories from proteins. Again, so it's falling within that range that's recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And the combination, as I mentioned, of partially hydrolyzed protein makes it easy to digest and to absorb by the child. 
Now, when we look at the MCT content, we can see as well that it has the highest amount of MCT as compared to the other PDA-short products. It contains 50% of MCT to facilitate absorption. Um, and as you know, MCT is easily absorbed by the body and used as a um, readily uh, available source of energy. In terms of osmolality as well, it's 320 milliosmoles per kilogram of water. So it's considered uh, near isotonic. And as you know, the lower the isotonicity of the formula, the more easier it is for the body to accept the product and to prevent any cases of osmotic diarrhea. So these three factors, uh, the partially hydrolyzed uh, peptide, in the formula, the osmolality, as well as the MCTs make this product a very unique product in the market. It's available in liquid form and can be used as either tube feeding or uh, oral supplement. So this is my presentation for today. Uh, I tried to keep it very brief and just take you through our entire PediaSure portfolio to kind of meet the needs of all the patients that you might be seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions now if there are any. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Janan, for that presentation. Uh, we have a question, but where is the question gone? Yes, yeah. Um, why these formulas are not available um, outside the UAE and Pakistan? This is a specific question. Yeah, so uh, different countries are available in different, uh, I'm sorry, different formulas are available in different countries, depending on um, the, the need of the product for the formula. Here in the UAE, we have a big hospital, uh, hospital uh, demand for these products. Um, and some of these products are not available even in Saudi, in Kuwait. So it, it depends on, uh, I think, the the conditions and the business in each, each country. I can't comment on Pakistan because I have no experience there. Um, but can these uh, be ordered like uh, from any other countries to del be delivered uh, within? I think uh, if the patient themselves uh, or the HCP would want to order it, they can do that or else they would have to contact someone from the Abbott team and that would be possible. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I don't think uh, we have any more questions. Uh, otherwise, like I mentioned, if uh, anyone would like to ask questions, even after um, we are over with the webinar, you can send them directly to us and we will be forwarding them to Ms. Janan or any of our speakers for tonight. Um, so just one more minute. Um, well, okay. Since we don't have any more questions, thank you very much, Mr. Nan, for that. And um, uh, thanks to everyone who have joined us uh, for our uh, talk. Uh, it was a very interesting topic, I can say. And um, CMEs will be available in 14 days from now. And you just have to fill out the evaluation form that will be sent on your registered email ID to be able to um, attain the CMEs. And I would like to announce our next upcoming um, conference, which will be the Emirates Clinical Nutrition Conference uh, held next year, 27th and the 28th of May, 2022. Um, it will be our final webinar for this year, but uh, stay tuned for uh, our uh, webinars, which will be announced soon, that will follow up to the conference of next year. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope you had a great time. Have a good night and goodbye.